Welcome to the annual Kodadat lecture. We are excited that uh, Prof uh, Dr. Kodadat is actually with us, uh, the sponsor of this lecture. We're very grateful for his support. And we uh, enjoy, of course, the fact that we have a, a, a lecturer this year who is uh, one of the pioneers uh, in the area of developmental aggression research. Uh, probably has the largest database that anybody in the history of research has ever accumulated to do. And that's the first remarkable feature about Professor Tremblay, um, namely to do longitudinal studies pursuing individuals from boyhood or childhood uh, all the way to adolescence and adulthood. The most remarkable, most remarkable database. That's, I think, the first remarkable feature. But I learned uh, while I was checking on him on the web that we have actually several common features. He and me were both uh, goaltenders for our school teams. <laughs> Of course, he played hockey. I, in my world, it was all soccer. Uh, but um, so that was a very pleasant surprise. And moreover, I also discovered we are, have the same birth year. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> we, all, we almost match each other with regard to the infamous age factor uh, in terms of citation success of our work. Uh, so. <laughs> So these were remarkable observations that I didn't know about before today. Um, what I would like to emphasize, however, about his intellectual achievements is that while being a developmental psychologist, he is also bridging the infamous gulf from the social sciences to the biological sciences. And I think I look particularly forward to his remarks about his work on epigenetics uh, which is, uh, of course, uh, the future. And I think I leave it just at that because you came here to hear him, not me, uh, Professor Tremblay. Thank you very much, Klaus. Um, it's, uh, it's an honor to uh, be invited to give this lecture um, and uh, thank you very much Dr. Kodadad for having created uh, this opportunity. Um, <clears throat> 1944 I, I did not realize but I've been recruiting people uh, in psychology uh, well in the social psychological biological s sciences who were born in 1944, uh, to write a book on <laughs> our experiences at the end of the war and what led us to uh, the type of research that they're doing. So we have another, uh, <laughs> another recruit. Um, so, um, <clears throat> of course, I'll be talking, uh, talking about aggression uh, I was a hockey player, but I was also a football player. Uh, my father played uh, professional football, and I was born with a football in my hands. Uh, <laughs> and it's a rough game, so uh, aggression sort of uh, was natural for me to get into. But uh, um, I'll tell you a, a little bit about the, the story. Um, Okay, so, uh, Hercules, think about uh, Hercules or Heracles, uh, if you take the, the Greek approach uh, to mythology, um, and the ten uh, labors uh, of, uh, of Hercules, and I, I've, I'll be focusing especially on uh, Hydra. Uh, and it's nine heads that you have to cut 
to, uh, to kill it. Uh, it's, for me, it's become a good example of the problems that we have in terms of preventing and treating people who have uh, behavior problems in general, and especially uh, problems with chronic physical aggression. Uh, so my career, professional career, starts at the bottom there, um, 1970. I was uh, coming out of uh, my master degree and I was hired uh, to work in a mental hospital for uh, criminals, dangerous criminals. So I spent three years in a prison uh, uh, working with these, uh, with these uh, men. And uh, after three years, I, uh, I was offered something else, but I, I was thinking, will I spend my, the rest of my life in prison <laughs> working with, with these uh, people? And, and eventually, I, I went to work with uh, juvenile delinquents. So I've been coming down uh, the, uh, the, the lifespan. Um, I started at the end with these hopeless cases in prison, uh, work with juvenile delinquents, and, and then uh, with aggressive kindergarten children. And then I s went backwards to newborns, and um, a lot of my work now is with pregnant women. Um, all of that focusing on the problem uh, of aggression. So what I will be presenting today is uh, that uh, sort of a, in that sequence. And when I was in university, if I had listened well uh, in my uh, Greek uh, Latin class and we were studying the, the Greek and, and Roman philosophers, if I had uh, paid attention to Aristotle, what he wrote in his book on politics, I would probably have saved uh, 30 years of, uh, of my professional life by starting at the beginning. He writes, he who considers things in their first growth and origin will obtain the clear clearest view of them. Um, so you'll see as uh, we uh, get towards uh, in this talk that I'm, I'm trying to make it clear that it's important to start at the beginning. The main topics I will be covering are what are the different developmental trajectories of physically aggressive behaviors, what are the causes of these different developmental trajectories, and what are the implications for uh, of these trajectories for the prevention of chronic physical aggression. Um, so, one of the clearest uh, fact in, in criminology is what uh, they call the age crime curve. This is data in the United States, 1980s, 1994-2010, and it's showing the age crime curve. The peak is around age 18, uh, so it goes up and down, um, and it's very stable over time, and so stable that if you go back, the first person who drew the age crime curve was Adolf Kittle in 1831. He was a mathematician, astronomer, and uh, he looked at the stars during the night and during the day. Um, he studied human development, and he studied physical development, measuring the height and weight of, of soldiers, and he's the one who invented the body mass index. He studied cognitive development, and he studied um, moral, what he called moral development, and this is the result of his moral development study where he studied uh, 
uh, criminals in the, in the French uh, prisons. Um, the stability is also uh, with reference to sex differences. In France in 1820, there were 11.7 women per 100 men who committed uh, homicide. And in the US, I, I took 2014, but it's like that every year, it's 11.6 women per 100 men. So the stability of, of that statistics is totally incredible in terms of, of human behavior. The panel on uh, understanding and control of violent behavior, and I think Klaus was part of that panel, and uh, they published their report in 1993. And uh, one of the uh, sort of conclusions, summary, was that Modern psychological perspectives emphasize that aggressive and violent behaviors are learned responses to frustration, that they can also be learned as instruments for achieving goals, and that the learning occurs by observing models of such behavior. Such models may be observed in the family, among peers, elsewhere in the neighborhood, through the mass media, and we could have today now in, on the internet. So the age crime curve has been seen largely as a learning curve, that we learn to aggress and we reach our peak at uh, around age 18. Uh, that idea was took up by the World Report on violence and health by the World Health Organization in 2002. And the way they said it is, the majority of young people who become violent are adolescent limited offenders, who in fact show little or no evidence of high levels of aggression or other problem behavior during childhood. And to a certain extent that uh, they, they cite uh, in that writing the Youth Violence Report of the Surgeon General uh, in the U.S. in 2001. So you see the, the idea that aggression is a problem of learning. Uh, this behavior has been repeated and repeated, and it was the main... <coughs> Uh, reason why in the early 1980s, uh, when I was starting my career, I decided to start a longitudinal study of kindergarten children, uh, kindergarten boys, because the problem is much more important with boys, and kindergarten boys from low socioeconomic areas in Montreal because if you look at the prisoners, uh, they, most of them come from low socioeconomic environment. And the idea was, well, let's start in kindergarten and let's study how they learn to become aggressive. What is, how, how do they learn these things over time? Um, and so we took a thousand, a little bit more than a thousand kindergarten boys from low socioeconomic areas. We had their teachers rate their behavior in kindergarten, and every year uh, we had the parents rate their, their behaviors. The children reported themselves their behavior. We assessed cognitive development. Uh, we assessed everything, physical development. And uh, we did direct observations at home, at school, in the laboratory. Um, and we even did a prevention experiment within that sample where we randomly allocated um, part of those who had the largest problems to a prevention program. That I, we can talk about it uh, in the question period, but I, I'm not presenting any data on the prevention part today. Now, the first results that we got once the children 
were um, 13 years of age was very surprising. Um, <coughs> the, you can see that uh, from 6 to 13 years of age, the mean frequency of physical aggression reported by teachers and, and mothers was going down. So the maximum was in kindergarten, and it was going. And during adolescence, there was sort of a, a slow, small increase, very small, between uh, 14 and, and 16. Um, and uh, I presented this data at Carnegie Mellon uh, in 1995, so, something like that. And there was a guy in the room. And I could see him talking to someone else. He came to see me after the talk. And he, his name is Daniel Nagan. And he said, um, you know, I have a way of analyzing that data that will tell us a little bit more about that mean level of aggression. Because there must be a group in there that's going up, and although the majority is going down. So we did these, what are called trajectory analyses. And these are the results that we got. We got four groups of individuals. The majority are on the low level of physical aggression. Uh, there's a group that shows a little bit, but coming down. So if you look, every group there, except the last one up there, um, are going down in terms of physical aggression. And there's a 4% of the boys whose level of physical aggression remains high from kindergarten. It's not going up. It's remaining high. Um, now, I'll show you a little bit more information on a recent analysis, analysis that we did. With a, a, it's, this is not the same sample, but it's a, a, a large uh, population cohort. Um, and uh, what I'm showing here uh, is physical aggression. The first row is physical aggression. The second row is indirect aggression. And I'm showing that because a lot of people say that there are big differences between the physical aggression and the indirect aggression. It's true. Girls are doing it more uh, than, than the boys. Um, and we, this is a, an analysis where we put all this information together. And we get five, uh, five groups uh, of types of, of development. Um, so there is the first group in, in yellow, uh, where no physical aggression, no indirect aggression. And um, it's 26% of the sample. And 76% are girls. Then uh, the second group, that, that group, no physical aggression, but some indirect aggression. And again, the majority are girls. The third group, where you have physical aggression going down and indirect aggression going up and then down, 61% uh, are boys. And the third group uh, are girls with high levels of physical aggression coming down over time, and indirect aggression high and coming down again uh, over time by age 13. And finally, uh, a group of 5% majority boys with high levels of physical aggression um, from kindergarten until age 13. And um, in same thing for indirect aggression. So indirect aggression and physical aggression are Approximately, it's the same type of, of trajectories uh, over time. Um, and we see that boys are uh, doing the worst things uh, compared to the girls. Now, I'm adding two layers here of behaviors. Um, it's information on whether it's proactive, you sort of attack people, or it's responding to an attack. So it's a reactive aggression. And essentially, it's telling the same thing, that proactive, reactive, indirect aggression, and physical aggression are all behaving in the same way. 
And surprising, nobody is low in kindergarten and going up. It's all either low, oh, high and going down, or remaining high, but nobody is learning to aggress from um, kindergarten onwards. Now, what's happening to the boys who are on the high trajectory of a physical aggression? They fail in school. They use, abuse, tobacco, alcohol, drugs. They have early sex, violent be, uh, behavior in adolescence and adulthood, depression, unemployment, poverty. Okay, so high aggression starting in kindergarten leads you to failure in life for the boys. The girls, you have a similar pattern. In this analysis, we included uh, hyperactivity because w only aggression, there are so few girls that you can't say much, but if you have girls with high aggression or uh, high hyperactivity, these girls go in adolescence, tobacco, abuse, school failure, early sex, partner aggression, depression, teenage pregnancy, and on welfare. Um, so there, there's a similar picture uh, for girls, boys and girls in, in the long run, although their behaviors are somewhat different in terms of problems early on. Um, <clears throat> this is data from uh, the United States on serious violent crimes by youth. Um, and video game sales in the US uh, from 1996 to 2006. And I'm using this to show again the fact that it doesn't appear that people are learning to be aggressive from the media, from their environment. There's more and more, there was more and more sales of these video games that are aggression and the, uh, the, the um, criminal, the youth violence was going down while they were consuming more of this, and it, it's true for television also. Um, so the conclusions from uh, these developmental studies are that physical aggression does not start during adolescence. Adolescence, frequency of physical aggressions does not increase after kindergarten. Children use physical aggressions most often during kindergarten. The most aggressive adolescents tend to be the most aggressive in kindergarten. And that's what led us to do a preventive intervention that started with these kindergarten boys. And, and briefly, we showed that we were reducing school failure uh, with an intervention starting in kindergarten and also um, criminal behavior uh, up to uh, age uh, 24. Uh, so when do humans start to physically aggress if they appear to be at their peak in kindergarten? So that led me to create the Quebec Longitudinal Study of Children, where it's a random sample of newborns um, in the province of, of Quebec in Canada. Uh, so we have about 2,000 children, and we evaluated them from five months of age upwards. They're now turning 22 this year. Um, and the sources of information are, again, everything we, can, we managed to get from uh, everybody that was interacting with these children. Okay, so these, uh, <laughs> this, these are uh, s five months, uh, five, yeah, five or six months. The boy on the right is, uh, the, gran is the grandson of a good friend of mine, and uh, that friend sent me this picture 
saying, look, my grandson is doing the things you're interested in. Um, and so I asked the mother, can I show this picture when I give talks? And she said, yes, at one condition. You must say that he was only defending himself. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> you learn very early in life uh, that when you aggress, it's, uh, you're defending yourself. Mother said that. So you don't need to speak French to understand what's going on there. Um, a three-year-old with, um, I think he's 19 months, the, the youngest one, um, they're brothers, and it's the mother who's talking about what's happening. Uh, cameras were put in, in, in the house to film these things. Um, so. It's very violent. The violence between young children is very violent. More than we imagine. We, we see it when we have young children. And, and, but wh when you put all of that together, these pieces, it sort of say, ah, oh my god. So the time in life when you're most likely to be aggress is there at that age in daycare centers. And, and so by measuring the physical aggressions um, between 17 and 60 months, my colleagues didn't want me to put aggression items uh, before 30 months. They were saying, you're crazy. People will be mad because you're asking them about these things, and it's it's not happening at these ages. They're too young. Um, but I, I managed to put in the questions. And, and so you, you see the trajectories. So from 17 months, it goes up for everybody. <coughs> and it goes up with it, it's the more you can walk and run and, and, and kick and, and punch, uh, the more you can do it. So. It, the physical aggression increases from early infancy to about 42 months and then starts decreasing. Um, this is data from a, a, a daycare center where it's showing the, the, the study was done by filming all the time. So it, the, there were uh, hundreds of hours of filming and uh, counting the number of aggressions per social interactions. A and so in kindergarten at 24 months, uh, there are, there's one aggression per four interactions, so social interaction. So imagine if uh, this is, was happening in the office or at the university. <laughs> one in four is an aggression, but that's what children go through in groups, uh, when they are put in groups in, in daycare <coughs> centers, or if there are enough children at home. So the, the, um, if we put all the data together from uh, one and a half years of age to 21 years of age, you can see that the peak in terms of physical aggression is around three, uh, four years of age. And after that, it's decreasing. Uh, now, if we revisit the age crime curve, in fact, the age crime curve is around 
the, the real one in terms of frequency of aggressions. And it's not small aggressions. You've seen these aggressions there. Um, it's around uh, three years and a half. And what is creating the, the official ACE crime curve is the fact that we're arresting people. Uh, it's arrest. The ACE crime curve is how many people were arrested. So we arrest them once they are big. If you put a two and a half year old to bed and he wakes up six feet tall, you won't want to live with that person. <laughs> That's for sure. It's, he's a danger. The way they're hitting each other, but they're small. They don't hurt the, each other that much. And we learn, we help them learn. So the conclusion from longitudinal studies is that humans do not learn to physically aggress. They learn not to physically aggress. We learn, that's what we learn. We don't learn to aggress, we learn not to aggress. Chronic physical aggression is very rarely late on. Of course, if you have a, if you're hit on the head and you have a trauma, you can start aggressing and you are not aggressing, but Normally, pe people don't learn to aggress after childhood. From the available evidence, this appears to be true for other behavior problems, such as stealing. Children are stealing all the time from each other, uh, and destruction of property. So which mechanisms handicap some children from learning to gain control over their physical aggressions? So among the mechanisms, you have genetic factors, environmental factors, genetic factors that moderate environmental effects and environmental effects on gene expression. And that's what we've been studying more recently. Uh, among our samples, uh, we have a twin sample, um, a large twin sample that we've been following from birth and from that sample, when we look at the aggressions at two years of age, that is at 20 months, 32 months, and 50 months, we can study the genetic and environmental uh, component because some twins are monozygotics and have the same genes, and uh, others are like brothers, and so Twin studies help us understand genetic and environmental factors. And, and so the results from that study indicated that genetic factors explain from 50 to 63% of the variance in frequency of physical aggressions at 20 months of age. The genetic effects are, at 20 months, substantially decrease over time while new genetic effects appeared at 32 and 50 months. Two separate sets of uncorrelated genetic factors accounted for the variation in initial level of aggression and change over time. So there is a strong genetic effect for the aggression very early in life that is to a certain extent stable, but the environment comes in and helps children learn not to be, not to aggress. Um, the environmental factors are what I've been calling hydra. They're similar to uh, Hercules' second labor. You need to cut many heads if you want to solve the problem. You need, if you want the child to learn, you need to take into account many, many factors. And here are uh, nine of these factors. Early motherhood, maternal low, low education, poor marital relationships, poverty, maternal anger, maternal depression, maternal stress, maternal nutrition, and smoking during pregnancy. A lot of maternal, maternal, maternal. And that's been <laughs> quite an eye-opener for me. 
I had spent all my career working with violent males and all the data on predictors of these trajectory, high trajectories of physical aggression are turning out to be mothers, mother, mother, mother. Um, so this study uh, published in August 2004 was a revelation. Um, Moshe Schiff and Michael Mini are colleagues from uh, McGill University. And uh, we were at a meeting about <coughs> two months after that publication. And um, Moshe Schiff was presenting that, that study of rats. To what extent maternal licking of their pups at birth have long-term impacts on how long you're going to live, uh, on your stress. And I remember most of the people in, in this uh, room, uh, in the room were, were uh, pure geneticians. And they were hearing this and they were saying, what are you talking about? It was the start of uh, this epigenetic movement uh, the importance uh, of, of epigenetic effects. Uh, and it sort of, for me, was uh, everything we were seeing about the predictors of aggression were maternal. And here we were seeing that a maternal effect uh, this early was very important. And so with Steve Sumi, um, uh, the primatologist was part of that uh, group that, that uh, we were meeting regularly. And um, we decided that we would look at um, the epigenetic effects of, of uh, uh, taking away the mother early on uh, uh, in these studies. And we looked at uh, this, the, the signature of maternal re rearing in rhesus monkeys, uh, looking at um, DNA methylation um, in the prefrontal cortex and in T cells. We were interested in that because we were saying, well, uh, if we're working with humans, uh, we, it won't be with the pre prefrontal cortex that we will be working with, but with uh, the T cells. Um, and so, um, <coughs> This is only to remind me to tell you that it changed my focus from males uh, to females. And um, looking at our data where girls were having all the, these problems and having young children, and the data uh, from other studies, this is a Swedish study on uh, patterns of non-random mating within and across 11 major psychiatric diagnoses. So if, if you think of what, how you get your genes, you get them from your father and your mother. And if there is a sort of mating in terms of behavior problems, it's clear that you're getting some kind of double dose of uh, genes that are, are creating problems. But at the same time, you're getting a double dose of a bad environment, of an environment that creates uh, problems. Um, so this is my summary of the hypothesis of the importance of gene expression um, early in life that leads to aggressive behaviors. We have a girl. Um, who failed in school, use, uses and abuses tobacco, has early sex, teenage pregnancy, partner abuse, depression, and from early on, she was rather aggressive and hyperactive. She mates with someone like her who's had problems. And uh, when the obstetrician or the neonatologist sees 
this girl who's pregnant, um, she, he sees or she sees a young pregnant woman that failed in school, that smokes, that's depressed, angry, stressed, malnourished, on welfare, poor, and has poor marital relationships. She's pregnant. So if we think of the Sumi's monkeys or the rats, we, we have a very similar picture of not good liquors. And so there's probably an impact of uh, an epigenetic impact on top of the genetic impact that leads to aggressive behavior in young children and an environment that is not conducive to learning not to aggress because the parents have the same problems. Um, so we tested the, the um, epigenetic hypothesis by taking uh, boys and girls who were on the top uh, trajectory of aggression. And what we got in terms of results was that for males, there were 448 distinct gene promoters that were differently, differentially methylated. Um, functionally, many of these genes were previously shown to play a role in aggression. Um, and we saw a similar picture for uh, the, the females. We also had um, brain serotonin synthesis on these, the male sample. And we showed um, that males with chronic physical aggression had lower in vivo serotonin synthesis in the orbitofrontal cortex. And uh, we then showed that the serotonin synthesis in the left and right orbitofrontal cortex was also associated with DNA methylation level in T cells and monocytes. Now, the limit of uh, that study is that DNA methylation was measured only in adulthood. And so you, it's either DNA methylation leads to aggression, but the life that you're living could be leading to DNA uh, methylation uh, problems that, that we saw. So we need another longitudinal study uh, that starts from birth where we measure DNA methylation at birth and we follow them. And luckily, there was a study in uh, Great Britain, uh, the ALSPAC longitudinal study, where they had kept blood from birth and with data uh, up to, in this case, it's up to 13 years of age. Uh, so the data from that study shows that prenatal maternal psychopathology, criminal behavior, and substance abuse leads to high oxytocin receptor gene methylation from birth to 13 years of age. The blood was collected regularly from birth to 13 years of age, and so the association is longitudinal, and it's associated with the callous, unemotional, and low anxiety of uh, the children at age uh, 13, which is highly related to uh, the aggressive behavior. Um, so those are correlational studies. And, and what we are working on now is an, epi an experimental study. Um, the model is the El Elmira uh, study, Elmira New York experiment that was done by uh, David Olds. And here it's a publication by Eckenrode in which uh, they showed that um, nurse home visitation from pregnancy up to age two reduced early childhood abuse of the children. It reduced the, the daughters being arrested uh, late in adolescence. It reduced 
the daughters giving birth before age 19 years, and it reduced daughters' use of Medicaid. So clearly, the intergenerational picture that I'm talking about here is that if we help mothers during pregnancy, we hope that it will help their children, boys and girls. But the results we're seeing here, it's helping much more the girls than the boys. And I think this is a very good thing because these girls that were helped because we helped their mother, they will help the next generation. So it's an intergenerational cause, but also the solution must be intergenerational. We need to help these girls from generation to generation. And uh, the, the study that we are working on at the moment, um, it's an identical twin experiment model where um, it's being done with astronauts. Um, why not do, an, do, <laughs> do it with um, humans and, and aggression? So the bulk of DNA methylation occurs prenatally. MZ twins have the same genes, but different prenatal environments. Monozygotic twins have different birth weights. The lighter twin tends to have more physical and mental health problems. So the MZ twins are ideal prevention experiment initiated during pregnancy and soon after birth because we can control for genetic effects. Um, and the timing of uh, the environmental effects. And, and so the idea is to do these um, prevention experiment with women pre pregnant of uh, twins, give them support, and study DNA methylation development from birth, study brain development, and study behavior development. Okay, so my conclusions. Epigenetic analyses have started to identify mechanisms by which the environment substantially impacts human development. Environments, mothers, fathers, nutrition, can possibly modify genetic programming better than attempts to directly manipulate genes. By enriching the environment at the appropriate time and intensity, we should have system-wide impacts on gene expression. Environmental effects on human development, like genetic effects, appear strongly intergenerational and highly linked to maternal development. If this is true, prevention of chronic physical aggression and other developmental problems need to take an intergenerational perspective and start in early pregnancy at the latest. This means that although chronic behavior problems are largely a male problem, its early prevention requires giving the best services to pregnant women and families of newborn. Because this targets the natural intergenerational biopsychosocial systems. This conclusion is also probably true for numerous other physical problems, such as obesity, cardiovascular disease, psychological problems like depression and substance abuse, and socioeconomic problems such as school performance and employment. Um, David Barker he, uh, has been working our, on cardiovascular diseases, um, work on that throughout his life, and concludes, chronic diseases are not the inevitable lot of humankind. We could readily prevent them had we the will to do so. Many babies in the womb in the Western world today are receiving unbalanced and inadequate diets, protecting the nutrition and health of girls and young women should be the cornerstone of public health. Not only will this prevent chronic disease, 
but it will produce new generations who have better health and well-being throughout their lives. So the conclusions for aggression are very similar. And the person that understood the, this very well and says it very succinctly is the chief of the Soli people in Zambia. She says, when you educate a man, an individual is educated. When you educate a woman, you educate her children and thus the nation. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk and discussion. Um, so my name is Cecilia Hinojosa, and I am a third year graduate student in Lisa Shin's laboratory. Um, and so my question for you is, um, one of the aspects that I admire so much about your research is the interdisciplinary aspect. Um, so you've worked with criminologists, epidemiologists, epigenetics, and the list goes on. So I hope to one day do the same with my research. So my question is, how did you begin these various collaborations, and how do you maintain them so successfully? <laughs> well, that answer could be very long. Um, I, I think the, the first forming experience was having a father who's a football player. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, when you play football, <laughs> you need many colleagues. We, you need to form a team. <laughs> And you need another team. And by six years of age, I was um, getting my friends and my um, cousins <laughs> together. Uh, I worked very hard at getting a lot of people together. A and football is, uh, everybody has his own discipline. Um, is you, uh, you have different roles. And so getting a football team together is very, very similar to getting a um, scientific uh, interdisciplinary team together. I mean, the, the other example I is uh, being a um, conductor of an orchestra. <laughs> and I, I, I guess I've, I've reflected a lot about that. and. Um, I, most of my colleagues like what they're doing, and they're sort of into right. it. I'm, I don't know anything about anything. <laughs> In the sense that I'm more of a uh, chef d'orchestre, an orchestra. Uh, I, I don't try to understand everything that's going on. I, I try to, under, to have the big picture and and to so, sort of get the people that are needed depending on what the picture is. So over time, uh, we, we started by being a few psychologists and, uh, and we invited people from other disciplines and epigenetics was the, the last part of it. But uh, Daniel Nagan was a uh, more of a mathematician, statistician, and we've been collaborating. He deals with that. I, I don't understand really what they're doing, but I, I'm getting them <laughs> to work together. Uh, and so um, it, I, I think my life is easier than, <laughs> than the others who, who are deep into uh, yeah. these things. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
All right. Um, so uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, so I'm actually uh, in Klaus Mitchek's lab. I'm Emily Newman. I uh, study female aggression in mice. So I'm kind of interested in uh, what you describe as this kind of trajectory of learning not to engage in aggression. And if there's, it seems like in childhood, it's almost default, the aggression is the default. And so is pathology, is, is it pathological? It, maybe not, I don't know. It, I'm wondering if it's actually pathological, the shift from either tactics of engaging in aggression or from just yes aggression to no aggression. So for instance, um, I think you showed the group four data where it was predominantly females and there's this kind of very linear reduction in uh, physical aggression. And I think, but when you look at the uh, indirect aggression, there's actually kind of this inverted U curve. So are females replacing physical aggression with kind of this uh, indirect aggression? And is it the shift from physical to indirect and then from indirect to no aggression? Are those where the pathologies lay? I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, it does make sense. Um, I'm trying to think if if we have tried to answer that that questions in terms of the link between the physical and the indirect and going from one to another. Towards to the indirect aggression starts around age four because it, it takes a, a little bit <laughs> more of a brain energy to uh, think about these things rather than, than physically aggress and it's it's quite clear that the girls are not aggressing as much as the boys early on physically and, and I mean never and, and that must be programmed in, in the sense that um, the the girl the the the, the genes know that <laughs> they are not going to survive I if they are using physical aggression with an environment that's bigger, stronger, etc. So um, the 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 switch from one to the other is uh, it's different. Prob I mean, there there are similarity for both sexes, uh, but. Clearly, the girls learn much more quickly to, in, to aggress indirectly. That, that's very clear. Uh, in the same way that they, they learn all sorts of other social things much more quickly than, than the boys. Sorry, um, guys. And, and, and uh, well, having a six-year-old there, I've been <laughs> looking at that very closely. And, and uh, recently, I, I was telling my wife, when I was in school, we were only boys. It was not mixed. It was, and I'm not sure that it's a good thing for males <laughs> to have this mixed education because the girls are, in terms of cognitive development, are clearly much better uh, quickly. And so for indirect aggression, it's, it's a plus to be able. Um, but the, the there is also the, clearly some individuals are born with more aggressive tendencies and, and that's true for girls and, and for boys and, and the girls appear to be going for indirect aggression. The aggressive girls are going for the indirect aggression. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Um, my name is Julia Felicioni. I'm a first year graduate student also in Dr. Lisa Shin's lab. And um, my question for you was more on the genetic side in terms of the changes that you found in the methylome in the OFC in serotonin synthesis, but also in the peripheral T cells and monocytes. So the way that I've commonly thought about aggression and stress is, and I think the way that also the American Heart Association thinks about it is that this physical stress will create these increases in inflammation increase, and increase these T cells and monocytes, which then creates more stress, which then creates more inflammation, and it spirals in on itself. And it sounds like what you're saying and what I was hoping you could comment on is that we might actually have the hour reversed and that these increased levels of T cells and monocytes and the decreased serotonin synthesis might actually be present much earlier than we thought. 
And I was wondering what you thought about that, what you thought about that and what might be most helpful for treatment. Well, um, yes, I, I think that it probably starts very early and uh, that the, at least the intervention from a psychosocial in perspective um, are uh, what I was saying that um, supporting the environment of high risk families and we, it's clear, our data are so clear that you can pinpoint the, the girls, the, the couples who will have the, these problems very early on um, and giving support as soon as they become pregnant. Uh, and intensive support will save them from a life of misery and will save a lot of money <laughs> for uh, for society if we uh, if we do that and if if we measure all these things and that's the aim of the intervention that we are planning um, is to measure as many things as possible from as soon as possible so that we can contribute information on uh, everything about the development of, of uh, cells to the development of social interactions. Um, and it's, it's crazy that we're not doing that, that the societies are not investing huge amounts in putting all the biopsychosocial sciences together on a large sample from birth and doing it uh, over generations. It's, I mean, Google is collecting all the data, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but they're not collecting the biological data. Maybe, maybe we need to go to these uh, companies and say, uh, let's put in uh, the biological stuff in there so that we will have all that information uh, over time. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very yeah. much. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Michael Leonard. I'm also a student of, of Klaus Mitchek. Um, and thank you again for the wonderful talk. That was a real treat. Uh, so I, like Emily, was sort of interested in this idea of um, learning not to aggress over time. And that, that sort of suggests that aggression is perhaps in some way biologically adaptive and that we learn to, um, to function in human society by suppressing those sort of um, those sort of behaviors. But I was wondering more about how that might relate to more cold, calculated um, aggression and violence, which has, uh, which seems to have less of an adaptive purpose, or at least a much less clear adaptive purpose. Do you see any sort of difference in trajectory or, um, or vulnerability for that sort of behavior, this more callous, um, calculated, Aggression? Um, I, I'm not sure. Are you talking about calculated in, in the sense of uh, in a war where you're planning to? Uh yeah, sure. It's, it's not, yeah, I mean, something that's less reactive but more. <coughs> um, like predatory, like it's predatory aggression, essentially, right? I mean, I don't know if it's predatory in <laughs> humans. Um, <laughs> But say like a premeditated murder or, or um, just more calculated, I suppose. Yeah, well, I if um, what I've been talking about, are, when I say chronic physical aggression, it's individuals that use, that are on the high trajectory. A and I mean, they're not, I mean, they can calculate at some point in time, and I mean, they, they can become uh, probably pe people who will uh, be hired to kill someone. Um, but I, I think that most of the people who, who aggress from a, in a in a war, if, if I'm a general and, and I 
plan the attack. I'm not a chronic aggressor <laughs> in the way that, I mean, most of the people that are killed in, on our planet um, in, I guess, in, in wars are killed by, it was a planned attack. Um, but the planners are, are not chronically aggressive individuals. And there must be some kind of personality uh, aspect to it. But we all, we, we certainly are all able to kill if needed. And we can most certainly plan uh, a killing um, if, uh, if, if needed. I mean, if, if we're put in a situation where our survival is dependent on killing someone, there's a good chance that we will plan <laughs> to get out of that situation. And if you need to kill, you, you will kill. So it's, it's different. Um, uh, we were not born angels. Um, no one is born an angel. And, and I, I, I think that that killing in instinct is in all of us. Thanks. Hi, my name is Mira Menon, and I'm actually a doctoral student in Child Study and Human Development. So my question to you um, is a little bit more on the broader side, on the prevention side of things. So I'm wondering, I think it's really great that your research is showing um, evidence for two generational programs and supporting um, mothers and children and families, but I'm wondering how much of um, the efforts should be going to just more in the like individual family unit versus addressing those broader systems um, that might precipitate these kinds of uh, not well, not good social circumstances. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Um, can you give me an example so, of broader? Yeah, like uh, uh, poverty or uh, racial inequity or other things that are like larger systems. Like how much of this is? Um, providing a lot of services to families and children and families early in life versus should the better, more um, financially prudent uh, op pathway to be to address like larger inequities. Yeah, well, I, I think we need the policies for to put in place the larger picture in terms of support. Uh, but the problem is that there is that level, uh, but the actions that are done within that more global system are mostly ineffective. A and for a large group of the population, it's not that much of a problem that they sort of get out of it uh, by themselves even if the system is not working as well as it should be. But for those who have the larger problems, uh, then uh, we're not solving anything by having a sort of a general approach to, to the problem that we need to really target very specifically, um, uh, let's say, 4% of the population that won't get out of it clearly by themselves and will be extremely costly over time. And what's more is that we need to experiment these things. There's such a waste of resources. The, most of the, I think that most of the resources that are invested in helping people from a social psychosocial perspective are totally ineffective. Every time we measure, we try to measure them, we show that they're not having the impact that they should be having. Uh, so that's an extremely big waste of, uh, of resources. Uh, and um, 
when I try to find where, where sh from where should we start to solve that problem, I most of the time end up at university where we are training the professionals who go into the system, the social workers, the psychologists, the, the nurses um, that do the social. Uh, all these people are not trained well enough to believe that science will is needed for them to do the job that they want to do. So we need much more to plan ex experiments, assess the impact, and correct after we have really um, shown that it works or doesn't work. Or, or if we were building planes in the same way that we're training people to work with poor people, we would never fly, <laughs> never. <laughs> Uh, and that's that's a major problem, and it, I think the problem starts where we're training there's these people, and it's in, in universities where we need to train people who know the importance of experimenting and correcting based on experiments. Medicine has done it pretty well, um, if we think about the hard medicine part. But the psychosocial interventions is uh, really still, uh, <laughs> you do your best and you ask for more money. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> that's it. Uh, thank you, Professor Tremblay, for being here. Uh, my name is Brian Burkhardt. I'm also a doctoral candidate in our child study and human development program here. Uh, and my research has to do uh, with youth programs on character development with Boy Scouts, West Point cadets. Mm. So I have a, an intervention question as well. And uh, you certainly painted a picture of some youth are dealt a very rotten hand, be it uh, genetically with certain things being activated through their parents or environmentally uh, with the, the nine-headed hydra there. Um, but I think as our understanding of epigenetics grows, it also should uh, encourage optimism that environmental factors can change how the genes are expressed and then that those can be passed down. So coming from a, a practitioner uh, intervention kind of point of view, um, I would wonder what sort of specific features of programs or interventions might lead to those kinds of positive changes. Uh, we talked in generalities, um, nutrition and families and mothers. I think the, the most specific one was licking uh, pups. So maybe thinking for people, are there any features that if you had a blank check on research and could investigate a few specific developmental features and programs uh, that you think would be most promising to, that you'd want to look more closely at? Yeah, well, um, clearly the um, targeting these uh, young girls that um, become pregnant uh, with a history of uh, behavior problems um, and intensive support. Um, the, the nurse um, home visitation program is is supporting these girls from as soon as possible in pregnancy up to age two. In we've started a uh, prevention experiment in uh, Dublin, Ireland, uh, where we started during pregnancy, but up to age five. Because you see, age two is uh, the time when the children are at the, their peak. And David Olds, who started that program, had not realized that they are stopping the intervention at the time when the children, the parents, and the children need it most. They're at their worst uh, at age two. It, the program shows that it's having um, a long-term impact for the girls, but I think these <coughs> programs would have much more of an impact if it continued over a longer period. Mm -hmm. So it's a question of the, the worst cases ne need the most intensive intervention for the longest period of time. Um, and, and so as I was saying earlier, I would invest my resources in starting experiments 
where you select those that need it most, invest the most early on, and continue as long as possible, and see to what extent we have the intergenerational effect, mm -hmm. and over generations, it will have this impact. So what I'm talking about is, takes a lot, intergenerational studies take more than a lifetime uh, uh, of any one of us. Mm -hmm. So we need teamwork today that will continue with teamwork in the next generation to be able to learn how to help uh, these individuals. And anything, anything that is shorter term is very likely not to be able to be very successful in the long run. Mm -hmm. and, and going maybe beyond, can I do a follow-up? Uh, going maybe beyond just prevention programs too, are there any particular attributes that you think should be promoted? Uh, empathy, forgiveness, are there things that through the promotion of certain things might uh, lower risk of aggression? Yeah, well we need to promote a, a lot. <laughs> Everything that is promoted in, in families that are successful need to be promoted more intensively in those families that are on these uh, high risk trajectories. Um, I, I don't believe in this uh, magic bullet that it's this thing that will solve the problem. It, it's, there are so many things that are needed to educate a child well. Um, you need to put all these things together and if it's within a high risk families, you need to double the dose and triple the, the dose. Great, thank you. Yeah, uh, I think that the impact of, of this violence in the media and it is at least supporting those who have problems with aggression. So it's a support to, and I mean they're consume the more they're they're consuming it, the less they're likely to 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 stop. Uh, the age crime curve shows that the major treatment for these individual is age, hmm. growing older. <laughs> um, by the peak is at 18, between 18 and 25. 
uh, Ketle, at the time of Ketle, it was 25. Uh, and Ketle had shown uh, that it's at 25 that you're at your peak in terms of physical strength. Uh, and since physical aggression requires strength, uh, the older you, you grow, the, the less you're likely to use aggression. But I, I'm not saying that um, the uh, violence in the environment is not having any impact. Uh, but it's certainly not the cause for, for that, but it, it's probably supporting those who are uh, not, um, <coughs> who, who have a, not a good control over aggression. And what impresses me most is when I'm, I'm flying uh, across the Atlantic or, or elsewhere, and I see all these um, men who are uh, clearly not aggressive. They're very successful in life. And they're looking at uh, aggressive uh, um, films <laughs> during the, the night. And I said, my god, how come humans like aggression? We, we love, we need <laughs> these things. Uh, and um, it, it's certainly not helping those who are aggressive, but it's, it's not making people uh, who are not aggressive uh, aggressive. Charles, at the Kenya, sometimes highly successful men are also very aggressive. Yeah, sure, <laughs> but it's not physically. Uh, it, uh, well, yes, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, but um, the, the, there is that aggressive temperament uh, that we have. Uh, that sort of, I like to watch a good game of football, and, I, and, and there is a lot of aggression in football and hockey. I like the suggestion that aging is a very wonderful therapy for <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I thank you very much. Thank you.